2020 has been a tough year for everyone, but we have not all been impacted equally. The coronavirus has had disparate infection and mortality rates in Black and Latinx communities. The economic downturn has caused too many of our small businesses to close and put black and brown workers most at risk of income and job loss. Protests have erupted in response to the racial inequality of today and reminds us of the present day impact of systemic racism and exclusion. Our city is suffering from incredible trauma on many fronts. And it's time we come together. We need a shared commitment to racial healing and transformation. We need to engage in truth-telling. We need to repair harm. We need to restore our wholeness. And we need every Chicagoan to be part of this work. As a mayor of the city, I've seen firsthand the difficult times we are experiencing. We may not always agree, but we must always commit to working together in solidarity to make this city great. As your mayor, I'll start by making a commitment of my own and I challenge you to join me. I commit to engaging in difficult conversations on the harms that have been created this year and challenging myself and my team to do better. I'm Pilar and I'm from Roseland. I'm a queen and I commit to learning about my own identity as a black woman. I'm Daniel and I'm from Wulan and I commit to reflecting on my own personal biases. I'm Lawrence and I'm from Lakeview, and I commit to initiating more honest conversations with my family about race. I'm Zaire, and I'm from Belmont Cragen, and I commit to making connections with my neighbors from backgrounds different than mine. I'm Candace, and I'm from Uptown, and I commit to studying the history of race and discrimination in Chicago and across this country. I'm Robert, and I'm from Bronzeville, and I commit to imagining a new Chicago and taking action to make it a reality. But, but I can't, can't do, do this alone. alone. We have to do it together. 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 Hi, my name is Megan McNeil. I'm from the Pullman neighborhood here, accompanied by my dear friend, Mr. Tony Cazzo. And I commit to using my artistry and lending it to the advancement of a more equitable Chicago. Mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Father, Father, there's no need to escalate. See, war is not the answer. For only love can conquer hate You know we've got to find a way To bring some understanding here today Picket lines and picket signs Don't punish me with brutality Come on, talk to me You will see Oh, it's going 
judge us simply cause our hair is long you know we've got to find a way to bring some understanding here to dare to put the day to day picket lines and picket signs don't punish me with brutality come on talk to me Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Together We Heal Virtual Summit. Uh, my name is Candace Moore, and I serve as the Chief Equity Officer for the City of Chicago. I'm also going to do a, a visual intro for, for folks that uh, may be visually impaired. So I am sitting in my office in a yellow dress with a bow right at my neck. I have, I'm an African American woman. I have on uh, leopard print earrings, uh, long braids, and in my office, there's a lamp behind me, as well as some pictures of some historical photos of African Americans in Chicago and a, and a shelf with some books. Um, I just wanted to make sure I gave that, um, uh, that, that um, uh, introduction to make sure um, we are um, sharing with our friends who, uh, who that can support. So I'm really excited about today. I always have to kind of hype myself up a little bit when I'm on virtual events because I can imagine myself in a room with all of you uh, really sort of feeding off of the energy that, um, uh, that we have this morning. Um, uh, I, we, I, me and my team and so many others that have contributed to get together, we are really excited about this morning and about our opportunity to share really what's been a journey, um, what's been a beginning of an, a journey, and what I hope is really uh, an area of light for so many of us here in the city of Chicago in the midst of some of the most challenging moments of our lifetime. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes here right at the top, and I just want to try to answer a few questions that I know folks probably have out there about Together We Heal. Uh, the first question is, why are we focusing on racial healing? The second, what happened over the last two months with, uh, with Together We Heal since we launched? And last, but certainly not least, what's next? Uh, where is this going? And so I want to start I want to start, um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, I want to start with the story of why. Why racial healing? Um, so the origin of this idea really came in, uh, the origin of this idea really came in last year. Um, just like you, I was processing the reality of this extraordinary moment we were in. There were overlaying crises of the pandemic, our longstanding racial inequity that exists in our city and in our society, 
the economic inequality and the, that really leads to, in some cases, over, an over 30 year life expectancy gap in, in our city. And in this moment, as I was processing this, not only personally, but as a chief equity officer, as a, uh, as a city worker, um, uh, one of the things that we really focused on was trying to connect with community to under, to make sure people understood what was going on, to make sure people understood the resources that were out there, but also to listen what were folks experiencing on the ground. And in that listening, you know, heard a lot, heard a lot about what was working, heard a lot about what wasn't working, heard a lot about people's fears and anxieties, the impact that everything has had on folks. And also, though, I heard this theme uh, about healing. Uh, it came in a couple forms. The first is this question, how are we going to heal? Um, uh, is, are we, can we heal from this with everything that's happened with so much up and down? What is healing going to look like? What is a path forward? Um, yes, we're talking about the right now, but how do I think about what's ahead? Um, additionally, the other vein that I heard was people, people holding down their communities in the midst of people, uh, supporting one another, people tapping into their resiliency, their historic resi resiliency, their ancestral resiliency, um, really finding those spaces that in the midst of some of the most trying times of our lives, folks were creating spaces of healing. Um, and some reflections that I had in that moment and what I was hearing is that healing is, for me, um, it's, not a, it's not a destination. It's a process. Um, I, I'm, I'm reminded of, of the words of my friend Pilar. Healing is a process. Uh, healing is, in fact, a muscle. Uh, you can and oftentimes you must exercise it in the midst of challenge and turmoil. There is no perfect time to heal. There is no perfect way to heal. Healing is not about perfection. Healing is about purpose. And perhaps the best way I've heard this notion described, it, it was actually in it's just this last week through the brilliant words of Miss Amanda Gorman. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm reminded of the poem that she delivered during the inauguration of President Joe Biden, the poem, The Hill We Climb. And so I just wanna take a second here to um, just share those words. And, and this is a particular excerpt from the poem. And it reads, and yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. And those words really sit with me. Um, and I, this question of about purpose really, really sits with me. So what is our purpose? What is the city's purpose? What is the Office of Equity and Racial Justice's purpose? And when it comes to healing, when it comes to this moment, um, if, next slide. Um, I want to share uh, our mission statement. And this is something that was created before the pandemic. Uh, this is our theory of change. This is, and it very much focuses on organizational transformation. Uh, so the mission statement is the Office of Equity and Racial Justice seeks to achieve equity in the city's service delivery, decision making, and, and engagement. Um, and this is something we created. Yes, it's a lot about organizational change for the, for the city. Um, it goes on to talk about how we will do that, how we will build capacity. Um, but I'll be frank in saying, I felt that in this moment, we as an office had a choice point. Um, we could keep powering ahead with our plans, with our heads down, or we can allow ourselves to be transformed by this moment. This is not abandoning our theory of change, but instead embracing imperfections of the moment and forging a purpose with racial healing at the center. 
So really to make a very long story short, uh, or maybe slightly shorter, <laughs> um, Together We Heal was formed uh, from these questions, from this experience. Um, it's not any single person's brainchild, but instead it's a union of ideas, energies, and actions. Our goal was to advance a moment for racial healing that could be felt across our entire city. We charge our communities and ourselves to commit to racial healing. And from December of 2020 to now, we've engaged in healing work and we've encouraged people to put it on the map, not just because the map is cool and, and it is cool. I'll give a shout out to the city's uh, assets, information and services department for the incredible work that they've done to put that together but to put it on the map so that we could see each other. So we could see the work happening all across our city. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I wanna start to just tell you a little bit of, uh, about where we're at. Uh, how have, have the last eight weeks, um, how have the last eight weeks, where have they taken us? So, when you look at the map, when you go to uh, shy.gov forward slash together we heal, I'm proud to say that that map reflects over 6,300 Chicagoans that have uh, made themselves seen, have put their work on the map, and it really is all across Chicago. 45 neighborhoods have been activated. Um, and from the south side to the west side to the north side to downtown, um, you can see the work happening all across our city. In addition, uh, here at the city, we've also um, stepped into this work. We actually held a city activation week for Together We Heal. And in that 32 city departments uh, set out different events and conversations to have real, real, real talk about issues of racial healing, to learn and to engage in this work. Additionally, we have had a candid conversation series that I certainly want to tell you a little bit more about. But through that series, by allowing people to peer into some specific conversations, we've engaged over 16,000 different viewers. And, that, and in all, our map, uh, the map that we've built together represents 155 different opportunities all across the Chicago. And to be frank, that's just two months. And to be real, I'd probably say it's more like six weeks because I, I, we were in the, the end of 2020 and, and given the year that we had, a lot of people really just took about two weeks off. So um, six weeks that, you know, we were able to produce this. And I know there's more work out there. I know that um, this isn't, this only is a, a small representation of the work. But I also want to share that I think as, as, as impressive as numbers can be, as important as it is to talk about the span of it, I don't want us to forget the depth of the work. Um, we've had really powerful um, uh, uh, lessons that people have shared with us. And so I just want to take a second to, sh to uh, uh, share some of those with you all. So the first reads, um, we've experienced death, sickness, trauma based on racism, et cetera, and we don't speak about it to one another. We put on our mask and come to work as if nothing is happening. We promise to ask one another moving forward, how are you? Is there anything I can do? This is the first time as a group we have openly spoke about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and it was powerful to hear how it affected all of us. Another reads, we hope participants will understand how we aspire to build an equitable Chicago region and will leave with fresh inspiration to be part of remaking our regional systems to be more just and resilient in the future. We discussed building an asset-based anti-racist movement, which means everyone working together across all racial and ethnic boundaries to identify policies patterns of injustice, discrimination, and or oppression encountered in specific times and places. Um, no matter where we start, the important thing is that we begin someplace. 
we cannot continue as we are and hope that things will change. Instead, we must make viable attempts at change for the betterment of our communities, as well as the future of our youth. For healing to occur, we must be brave enough to have difficult conversations about race in America. It is everyone's responsibility to become involved in the healing process. As an organization, we must be committed to racial equity and do so without judgment. Last, we are still one city, one people. I wasn't looking for anything, but got more than enough. I got a healing and I got an emotional breakthrough. These words come from city departments, they come from community leaders, they come from folks that work with and are part of the business sector. But the through line between all of these words is that these are Chicagoans. These are our words. This is our power. This is our moment. And the question that I think we have to ask is, where will we go from here? I want to share that Together We Heal has, has been envisioned to be a, a real multi-pronged strategic plan for the Office of Equity and Racial Justice. Uh, much of what you have seen and what we focused on in the last couple of months has really been about supporting healing in communities. And community doesn't just mean external to city government. It is also thinking about inside our institutions and the communities that we have established there, but really sort of focus at what, how can we connect? How can we learn more? How can we build a muscle for healing? Um, in addition to that work, uh, conversations and work around leading public and collective reckoning um, and also owning institutional transformation. So where have we began in our work at the office? So one, on supporting healing in communities, we definitely wanna to continue to grow our healing map through the end of March. I've gotten the feedback loud and clear that, you know, hey Candace, I know you're ambitious, but two months is just a start. I absolutely agree. It was never meant to just be, we're gonna get healed as a city in two months. But instead, the map was meant to serve as a tool for us to see each other, for us to connect. And so folks have said they'd like to continue to do that. Many folks have built more ideas. And so we'll continue to keep that map open until the end of March. I have this grand vision that um, we'll look up at that map at the end of March and see every single one of our neighborhoods represented. 45 is impressive, but we have 77 community areas. Can we challenge ourselves to see that work in every one of our neighborhoods? We also want to extend this work around healing. Um, and part of what we'd like to do is actually co-create a plan for a year of healing. What does it look like to really build and really think together about how could a longer run, a much more intentional run, uh, run around healing look like? In the area of leading public and collective reckoning, um, you, I'm pleased to share that today you'll learn a little bit more about the folks that have been working on the Monuments and Memorials Task Force, which I think is a really important conversation for our city. In addition to that, um, we must, and I'm excited that this will be an opportunity for us to build a shared foundation for defining what equity means for us as a city. There are a number of definitions and ways in which people look at equity. And yes, I could have just picked one and said that's going to be the city's definition. But I think leaning into our purpose, the ability for us to build that together is critical. And along with that, a process for truth telling, healing and repair. And then in the pillar of owning institutional transformation. We have already established and we will continue to cultivate a network of racial equity liaisons across all our departments and agencies. And with that, put, uh, supporting each department to set explicit racial equity goals that they will hold that they can hold themselves accountable to, but also that provide opportunities for our, our communities to support in really advancing those goals. And then another very exciting project that we've been working on is the equity dashboard, which is one way in which we are trying to answer the question of uh, how do you measure success? What does success look like? So I'm pleased to share that the OERJ site is live. Um, you can find it at chicago.gov forward slash equity. 
And on it, um, we have the first phase of our equity dashboard. There's a lot of data that we want to be able to organize and to display in ways in which folks can use it. The first phase was really sort of looking inside the house and looking at particularly our workforce. So the equity uh, dashboard, the employee diversity summary, uh, be gives people an opportunity to kind of break down what does the city look like? What does our workforce look like? And so folks can find that on our website today. Um, in addition to that, we have launched a survey um, uh, because we want you to help us build a vision for racial healing. Um, and so that survey is on the Together We Heal page, shy.gov slash Together We Heal. And this is one way in which we will get feedback from all across Chicago about how do folks think about racial healing? How do they think about equity? So that is live. We already have over 400 Chicagoans that have contributed to that. And we invite you to add your vision today. And if you do, it only takes five minutes, pass it to a friend. We want as many people contributing to that so that we can build a collective vision. In addition to the survey, uh, this afternoon, we will come together with about 500 different Chicagoans to really go even deeper on the question of how are we gonna define healing and what does a year of healing look like? And so we really are looking forward to that feedback so that we can build this together. Um, and I just wanna make sure that I share this has been a journey and there's been so much impressive work that has happened, but by no means is this work that we have done alone. Um, I have to give kudos and, and a shout out to so many of the people who have poured into this work. These are just a few key people and there are plenty more that I know that I'm missing, but I have to recognize our anchor partners who have been with us since the beginning pushing us to think deeper, to move our ideas, to be more expansive, to think in ways we hadn't th uh, thought before. So I wanted to lift up the YWC YWCA of Chicago, the American Jewish Committee, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Chicago, the Equity Advisory Council that's made up over 19 different individuals, the Racial Equity Rapid Response Team, which is made up of, 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 of about six different organizations uh, from across the city, and the Chicago Community Trust, who has brought in the work alongside the um, Healing Illinois, uh, which is led by the Illinois Department of Human Services, um, and uh, really brought in all of the stakeholders that that work has 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 um, included. Other key partners, Civic Consulting Alliance, Public Narrative, Esri Chicago, Zeno Group, and Decode that have helped us around so many of the logistics. And then a key group of funders who invested in this work early on and were flexible when the pandemic hit to allow us some space to vision what this moment could look like and really produce Together We Heal. The Chicago Community Trust, J.B. Morgan Chase, Chicago Beyond, the Conant Family Foundation, Crown Family Philanthropies, the Field Foundation, the Irving Harris Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, McCormick Foundation, Polk Foundation, the Pritzker Family Foundation, the Stone Foundation, Woods Fund of Chicago, and MacArthur Foundation. We're certainly grateful for all of the support that folks have given to this work. And we know that there are many more out there that are ready for this next phase to build together. And so as I move to, 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 to close out here, I wanna make sure I don't forget to come back to a point that I mentioned early, the Together We Heal Candid Conversations. Um, these, when I step back and I think about all of the work that has happened for Together We Heal, I've been incredibly grateful. But I really do want to lift up uh, this very special partnership that we established with Public Narrative and its leader, Jamira Alexander, who helped us bring this to life. Candid Conversations was a response to the question of how are people going to kind of know what these conversations sound like, what these could look like? How can we invite more folks in who might be don't know how to start, but want to at least kind of hear? And what we were able to pull together was a really um, uh, impressive amount of conversations um, with some real nuggets and some real gems that I just want to take a moment to share with you all. 
Uh, the first is a candid conversation with the healers. Uh, Saida Taylor, Dr. Obari Cartman, Jose Rico, and Alexa James joined us in that candid conversation. And what I just want to share with you are a few uh, key words that came out of that conversation that, I, that gave me a lot of power and light and that I hope to, do, does the same for you. Uh, Dr. Cartman, convincing others my life matters is wasting my time. Jose Rico, we don't need much investigation as to what needs to change. Saida Taylor, we came into this world perfect and normal. Alexis, Alexa James, apathy is never a response to inequality and inequity. The following week, we had a candid conversation with, that we called the neighbors, and we were graced by the brilliance of uh, Tanika Lewis Johnson and her folded map project. And she invited a couple of the MAP twins that are part of her project, Nanette Tucker, Wade Wilson, and Jennifer Chan. Uh, and in that conversation, I'll share uh, a, a nugget of wisdom that uh, Tanika dropped, which is the momentum to bring change starts with us connecting with one another. The following week, we had a conversation with the faith leaders. This was the same week in which the inauguration was happening. And um, there we had Father Tom Hurley, Janan Mohajir, uh, Pastor George Daniels, and Lawrence Bolitan. And a couple of words from that conversation. Uh, Lawrence, what a beautiful world we would have if people loved one another. Janan, the tactic of othering comes from white supremacy. George Daniels, our communities need to be valued, not devalued. And Father Hurley, when there's no kinship, that's where the trouble starts. And just this week on Thursday, on, on Wednesday, we closed it out with our last candid conversation, the storytellers. And um, there we were pleased to have Taylor Moore, Emily Hooper Lasana, Rishma Shah, and Avery Young. And a few key messages from there, Grishma, children are the influencers of our future. Avery, the media had the power, has the power to shift the story. And Emily, the work of the storyteller is to help us remember what makes us alive. These are just a few nuggets from those conversations. You can find all four conversations at publicnarrative.org forward slash events. But I'm pleased to share with you all one more candid conversation. And um, this is the first time we're showing it. It's our last one, a candid conversation with the leaders. And um, we, were, we were grateful to have uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Governor J.B. Pritzker join in a candid conversation. And we will share that now. Thank you, everyone. So, so Governor, thank you for uh, joining us in this uh, important conversation about how we move um, folks forward and really heal um, as a city and a state, and if I can be so bold, really how we heal as, uh, as a nation. Um, but let's start with a, a little bit lighter note, and um, what's your favorite Chicago memory? Well, I have to say, um, uh, you know, it's uh, maybe one that a lot of uh, moms or dads have, uh, and I know that you're a baseball fan, Madam Mayor. Uh, so uh, it was the first time that I took my son and daughter to a Cubs game. Uh, I was so excited to expose them to something that I love, and I hoped desperately that they would be as engaged in the game, you know, as I would be. And uh, the good news is that my uh, daughter was mesmerized by everything going on on the field. Uh, just focused on, you know, the the. Uh, this was just during the warm up, um, and then my son couldn't have cared less. He was he had Star Trek figures with him, and he, you know, basically got out of his chair, put the Star Trek figures on the chair, and you know, started playing with them and didn't care if we were at home or anywhere else, but it was my daughter that was really fascinated by it. So uh, that's one of my favorite <laughs> memories and you know, a great opportunity for me to just see who my kids are. My son, of course, is a massive Cubs fan now. 
<laughs> that's that's great. Um, How about your? It, it, it's it's hard to pick just um, one memory because I've had um, many over the years. Um, but I, I think where I will go um, is when I first came to Chicago. I came here um, as a law student. I'd never lived in a city um, as big um, as Chicago, and I was just overwhelmed but amazed by um, all the neighborhoods and all the complexities. But I remember um, in the fall of uh, 86, uh, when I first moved here and I was a poor struggling law student at U of C, I lived right near the lake. And in particular, I lived right near uh, the point in Hyde Park. And I remember going out to the point and looking northward toward this extraordinarily beautiful um, city with all the big um, high rises and um, architecture, but also just the majesty uh, of the lake. And I've got a lot of great Chicago memories, but that's really one that, that sticks out to me that, you know, even from afar, um, I experienced the incredible diversity and richness of, of Hyde Park. Um, but also looked back on this majestic city and a beautiful lake. Sure. So, uh, Mayor, I, I know um, one of the uh, questions that uh, was posed to us was a question about, you know, uh, just given all the challenges that we've gone through, all of us mm -hmm. in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois over the last year, um, and of course the, the racial reckoning moment that we are in, um, what's a personal reflection that you have on that a as a leader? <clears throat> well, there's, there's many lessons that I feel like I've learned over the course of this really, really hard year. And <clears throat> you know, I have had a number of discussions um, in trying to figure out the path forward and what was the right thing to do. Um, but I think for me, <clears throat> the biggest lesson learned um, for as a leader is really to listen. Um, you know, it, it's easy to kind of react in the moment. Um, it's harder to show that restraint that really is required um, when you're listening. Um, but I think coming to um, circumstances in and with people with a really humble heart um, and um, a willingness to listen and learn from um, what people are really saying and what 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 their their frustrations are, what their anger, what their aspirations are. Um, when I've held back and just allowed myself the luxury of listening, better things, I think, come from <clears throat> that experience than trying to rush in and solve the problem. And, you know, I think you and I are similar in this way. We want to solve problems. We want to help people. Um, and that's our reflex. We want to jump in, but sometimes it's better to just sit back and, and listen and really understand where people are and that way then use that experience to, to craft the solutions. Hard to do um, when you feel you know, like you want to demonstrate uh, that you're uh, an effective leader, but I think powerful lesson for me. And how about, how about you? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's such a great reflection, and and honestly, it plays into, you know, it fits nicely with the way I think about, you know, the most important things about the last, you know, what what I would reflect upon, because the the racial reckoning that we're undergoing, I mean, I think it's vitally important, particularly for somebody like me, to to listen, and also to make sure that you're surrounded by people who can, you know, help you understand the depth of the feeling that people are having in communities of color about what was going on. I mean, George Floyd was a, a spark for many people uh, that made them uh, stop. Let, let's start with the African-American community where uh, many people had experienced uh, something like that or something short of that or knew somebody who had had that experience right. and 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 knew somebody who died at the hands of of police who had done wrong and mm -hmm. but but i did not i mean i knew people maybe in a secondary fashion um, but not a close friend 
that I could, you know, ask uh, about their experience or that I had heard from already. So the fact that I had this diverse staff that I had put together, my senior staff is the most diverse in the state's history. And I realized how important that was uh, in that moment, that, that I had senior members of my staff, men, uh, uh, I remember one man in particular who, who walked into my office, a black man, um, closed the door, and he was simultaneously emotional, almost crying and angry. And he was expressing to me what it is that he felt about what was going on and that mm -hmm. he, he didn't know exactly what he needed to do, but he felt like we needed to do something. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we ultimately, you and I and, and many leaders, I think, um, uh, have taken uh, the, the, the listening that we did during this time period and even the experience that you've had as a, as a you know, for your entire life um, as a, a black woman and been able to bring it to bear in uh, legislating and uh, creating laws and trying to protect people from uh, the, the you know, sins of many years, of decades, of, of centuries, really. Um, and uh, we've tried to bring action to it. But <laughs> the fact that you mentioned listening and the thing that I was thinking most about is the people that surrounded me helped me as long as I listened to them, and I did, uh, they helped me to really uh, feel what they were feeling, uh, and then to you know act upon that. So um, yeah. that's that's something that really sticks with me about those you know, moments in the middle of the summer. So if I can just add to that, I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about my dad um, over the course of this year. Um, my dad grew up very very poor. <clears throat> in in Arkansas, <clears throat> in a little tiny town that's was so small that it doesn't exist anymore. <clears throat> Literally like a dirt road through the cotton fields. Um, and then you saw kind of a little cluster of, of houses. Um, but my father spent a lot of time <clears throat> talking to me about his experience uh, growing up in the Jim Crow South. And really the daily humiliations that he and his family and everybody in their black community and trying to um, stay out of harm's way. And I thought a lot about the stories that he told me growing up. You know, I grew up obviously in a very different time and I would say to him, well, I would never stand for that. I would never do that. And he would say, no, you would because you'd, you'd do that to survive. And, um, you know, your, your comment about, you know, do you know someone who's experienced this? Uh, my, um, my grandmother's um, husband was killed by the Klan um, when, before my mother was even born. Um, and no thought that there would ever be any kind of accountability. This man went on to live his life. Um, our family left um, Alabama. My, my mother's family was from Alabama as a result of that racial violence. But so a lot of these things are just so deeply ingrained in the family stories and lore of black folks going back multiple generations. And it was something about this moment, you know, and there've been other moments of course, but really something about <clears throat> this moment, this summer that um, unleashed those, I'll say centuries of pent up anger and frustration and fear um, that I hope we continue to use as fuel to address the, the wrongs of the past and the present. Um, it's hard, it's hard figuring out in many instances um, what is the right thing to do in the moment. But that's why I say, rather than for the react for me, is I wanna draw upon my own life's experience. I wanna listen to the pain that people in the city have experienced because it's different than what I experienced growing up in a much smaller town um, and get to a, a place that we're the better for it. Um, and I think we're still very much on that journey, but um, I will say it's great to have a partner with you, like you. Well, thank you. And I would remind you that uh, when we were over the summer, uh, you know, uh, experiencing uh, those, you know, the really all summer um, and it continues even today, 
but experiencing those moments. I, I remember the context. We had a racist in the White House. Yes. And <clears throat> and that is a that's the, the broader context of, you know, there were these 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 um, injustices that were occurring at the hands of police and people were reacting to them, but it was the broader context of a nation and a leader that wasn't listening. And therefore, there was a moment there where we really, I think all of us, took the opportunity to, to begin the process of change. And it's ongoing, and there's more to do, but it's accelerated, and I'm honestly excited about what's happening. I agree with that. I agree with that. Well, I know that um, you know one of the um, you know having all of that uh, experience. I think uh, you know over the you know as the tensions were mounting and uh, a lot of concern across the country. But you know, I know we all uh, felt like uh, there was something maybe that stood out, like a conversation or a person or. Um, you know, uh, something that you experienced a moment, maybe over the summer or during the last year at some time, uh, that really gave you um, hope that in the midst of all of the difficulty, that, you know, hope kind of emerged in some experience or person that you, uh, you know, that you uh, saw or, or felt or spent time with. So I, I wondered whether you have a memory of that of last year. Um, I, I do, um, and there are, again are, are many, but one that I will share is this, um, <clears throat> that horrible um, last weekend of, of May where we saw violence and looting come to our city in a way I really think we'd never seen before, but certainly not since the late um, 60s. That Monday morning was June 1st. Um, and I got up early and started on the far south side. I wanted to see the damage and the harm uh, firsthand. And it was two days before we were supposed to start reopening for the first time after a spring of, of shutdowns. And I saw just devastation all over the city. Um, it, businesses that literally there was nothing left in the store. Um, even the shelving was gone. And every single person that I met, I asked the question, you know, should we reopen in two days time? And what I heard from every single person without fail in every neighborhood was we have to. Uh, we have to because we need to not let this moment define us. We have to because our customers need to see us. Um, we have to because our employees um, need to work. And, and I thought to myself, if these business people, and a lot of them were really small businesses that, you know, were, as they were saying this to me, literally shedding tears of pain um, for what they had lost, the sacrifices that they had made over so many um, years just gone um, in an instant. If those folks still had hope in their heart and were willing to move forward, how could I not have hope? And I thought a lot about that day and the, those experiences many, many times since. Um, and there are lots of other examples, but that one in particular, where you're standing in the, literally in the middle of a debris, broken glass, um, everything shattered all around you, but yet those individuals, men and women, still had hope in their heart. Um, that gave me um, a lot of um, a sense of what the resiliency is of the people um, in the city, but also just something I have carried forward with me and I hold very, very close uh, to me in times of despair, I think about them. And, and I, I had you something have, similar. You have yeah. Well, 
Well, I, I had something similar uh, happen, and I, I was, you know, I'll just tell you that there was a restaurant. I went to visit um, during the summer, you know, when we were uh, trying to rebuild, uh, and there was a, a, a small restaurant in a strip mall. You know, I was really shaking hands and, and getting to know some of the people at these small businesses that had been affected, and this was a small strip mall. Uh, in which uh, this uh, elderly African American woman, uh, you know, stood at the door because you know we weren't going inside because there wasn't any in in indoor uh, dining at least at that moment. Um, and uh, she was doing takeout and you know making the business work, but she had broken window and uh, a, a piece of plywood over it. Um, and she was standing in the doorway and she was glad to you know to meet to meet me and. Uh, and her son standing behind her and she she's probably 70 years old and this is a place mm -hmm. that clearly she had owned for some time and so i asked her well you know uh what can i do to help and and how are you getting through this and she said i'm just going to get through because i have to get through and mm -hmm. I, i'm gonna you know, I'm, I, you know, she she kind of expressed this sort of almost like she's had to do this before in her life yeah. many times yeah. Um, and that Absolutely. kind of spirit of perseverance, of the the ability to just pick yourself up and you know, and uh, after you got knocked down and just keep going. Um, so I had that feeling like you're describing of 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 hope that came from her. And then I'll just add to that that I don't think there was a speaker uh, that got me more emotional at the recent inauguration of President Biden. Uh, than uh, our youth poet laureate, uh, you know, Amanda Gorman. She was, um, I didn't expect it. I saw her stand up. I didn't know who she was. Um, she, she stood up there and and maybe 45 seconds or, or a minute into it, I turned to, I was with two other people. We were all socially distanced, but watching this uh, this. Uh, program, you know, watching the inauguration. And and I turned to somebody and said, how old is she? Uh, because <laughs> yeah. she's, you know, she spoke, she spoke like she'd lived a whole lifetime. Yes. And yes. You know, she's 22 years old. Phenomenal. Uh, Absolutely. Amazing. She, Phenomenal. She, and she summed up a lot of what, what I think many of us feel about you know about the moment that we're in and the moment that we've experienced over the last year she was uh, incredible i was at home watching it uh with uh, amy and viv um and we kept saying viv look look um but yeah she was just absolutely phenomenal um her story is incredible you know training herself to also overcome uh, a stutter and nervousness and really memorizing a lot of, this, uh, of the, the poem. Um, really, you know, when you see something like that, it's just beaming, um, really beaming with pride. Um, I also felt so I, inadequate. I don't know about you, I felt inadequate. <laughs> yeah, I thought about myself at that age and thinking, could I have done that? No chance whatsoever. So you got to give it uh, you got to give her her props. I mean, she not only is obviously supremely talented, but to to perform on that kind of a stage uh, with the world watching, um, just a lot of pride, a lot of pride for her. Yeah, and I think for our nation, uh, really, I just mm -hmm. I was moved. I really was. I'm almost to tears. Uh, uh, well, Mayor, I, I know that the last question that um, was posed to us was, uh, was what song uh, would you um, play to inspire our city and our state uh, on the journey toward racial healing, uh, toward racial equity, uh, you know, toward a better tomorrow? Well, that was a hard one for me, um, mostly because I'm a huge uh, music fan, and, and I really do believe that um, songs kind of capture uh, the, the, the moment. Um, so I'm going to pick one that may seem strange, but um, it's one that inspires me, uh, because if you listen to the lyrics, it's about fighting through adversity um, and, and, and claiming um, victory. And the song is um, Just One Victory um, by Todd Rundgren. 
Um, I know an unusual choice, but I grew up hearing that song. I have siblings that are older than me um, and uh, we're heavily into uh, the music of the 70s. Um, so I'm very much influenced by them. It's a song that I've been hearing in my head um, since I was very, very young. Um, and it, it is about fighting for what's right um, and really claiming your place, screening out all the noise, but being really focused on purpose. So I think I would, I would advocate for uh, Just One Victory by, by Todd Rundgren. That's awesome. Um, well, for me, um, I, you know, I, I thought a lot about what, what would bring healing, what would, the first thing that came to mind was just, you know, thinking about songs that are soothing in some way, you know, that, that, um, that, you know, bring down the temperature, you know, and so that we can all breathe and talk to one another. Uh, but there's yeah. this great, and, and so I chose one like that. Um, and there's this great song, um, you know, Change is Gonna Come, and yep. you know, Sam Cooke song. And yep. it was written and performed before I was born, uh, but, you know, but in the in the crux of the civil rights movement. Uh, and it, it's so, you know, it's so even today, here we are 40, what, uh, 57 years later, uh, and that song is relevant uh, to this moment and it's soothing, but it's a reminder, you know, that, that I think on the subject of hope, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, the challenge, uh, but the hope, I, I think that one does it for me. Well, great choice. And, and anything by Sam Cooke is always a great choice, but uh, particularly that one. Well, thank you, Governor, for um, uh, this uh, great conversation. Um, really appreciate your leadership, and uh, we just got to keep uh, fighting the fight on behalf of our our residents. Uh, they need us, and we need them. Well, you're terrific. It's been great being partnered with you in these endeavors, and uh, and I know we have a lot of work ahead, but I will we'll, uh, you know make progress. Right, change is going to come. We, we're making progress even now. All right. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. So um, I just wanna thank Mayor Lightfoot and Governor Pritzker for that. Um, so it's so rare that we kind of get a peek into a candid conversation with our leadership. And this is really what our entire candid conversation series has been about. It's about a powerful display of Chicagoans grappling with hard truths of Chicago's racial history and then navigating through personal storytelling and dialogue. Um, we're really grateful that both the mayor and the governor are committed to this work and to continuing our collective journey towards racial healing and transformation. And I would also add that for everyone out there, um, having a candid conversation doesn't have to be that daunting. Um, one of the tools that we've built out as part of Together We Heal is the conversation starters, which are on the website, shy.gov slash Together We Heal. Uh, it can be as simple as just using those digital cards to prompt a conversation or creating your own uh, critical questions to really pose to a group. The key is to make space for one another, to listen, to give everyone a chance to answer and to really then see where the conversation goes. So I invite you all to use that as a tool to support more conversations in your own communities and your own networks. Um, but one example of, 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 of the power of this work and the, the commitments that we can make, um, I think is really displayed in the city of Chicago's Memorials and Monuments Assessments Project. Uh, in August of last year, the city of Chicago, in partnership with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, the Chicago Park District, and Chicago Public Schools, launched a racial healing and reckoning project to assess memorials, monuments, and other art across Chicago. And for the last five months, this committee has grappled with the often unacknowledged or forgotten history associated with, with the city's various municipal art collections. 
Um, uh, up next, uh, you will hear from the artists and the arts administrators who have contributed to this new framework to memorialize Chicago's true and complete history. And so I'm pleased to welcome the Memorials and Monument Assessment Project uh, uh, Committee uh, up next. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. That beautiful film tribute that you just saw is, is called Acknowledgement, and it was created by a brilliant artist named Santiago X, whom you will hear from shortly. My name is Jennifer Scott. I am one of the three co-chairs for the new Chicago Monuments Project Advisory Committee, along with Commissioner Mark Kelly, who leads the Department of Cultural Affairs for the city and Bonnie McDonald, who is the president and CEO of Landmark Illinois. It is my pleasure today to share a little bit about the Chicago Monuments Project and to introduce you to some of the project committee members who will share their work and perspectives on monuments, memorials, public art, and the ways in which these works can contribute to healing and truth telling. And hopefully at the end of the presentations, we will have a little bit of time for discussion. So the charge of the Chicago Monuments Project is right in line with the theme today of healing. It intends to wrestle with the unacknowledged, erased, distorted histories of Chicago's history. And in particular, the very hard truths of Chicago's history, which 
you've heard a little bit about this morning that often falls along racial divisions. And the project also aims to develop a new framework for marking public, public space and to memorialize Chicago's history. There is four tasks of the project. The first is to assess the city's public art collections by working with sister agencies uh, like the Chicago Parks District and the Chicago Public Schools. There's also an advisory committee that's already been appointed. There are 30 of us strong. We've been meeting regularly since the summer. Uh, we will be making recommendations on existing monuments and also any new monuments for public art that can be commissioned. And a very important part of this process is creating a platform and is for public engagement. So as many opportunities as possible so that we can get feedback and engage with one another and learn from one another how we think about monuments and memorials. As I mentioned, there's an advisory committee. It's extremely diverse. Uh, a group of community leaders, artists, architects, scholars, curators, city officials, activists who are dedicating their time, a wealth of experience and perspectives, and you'll hear from quite a few of them today. The timeline uh, is that very soon we'll be announcing some of the monuments under review that have been flagged that are problematic for public input. Uh, and we'll be launching a website for you, be, for you to be able to interact with those directly. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a series of community engagement, uh, community stakeholder discussions, and opportunities to offer public feedback on this topic. Uh, we will be working with artists to create new work for monuments and ideas about memorializing. And of course, all of this will go into a report which will make recommendations about the existing monuments under review and new work to be developed. Which monuments are under review? Um, out of a collection of over 500 sculptures and commemorative plaques on the public way and in Chicago parks, uh, there we have flagged thus far a little over 40 monuments uh, because of these bulleted points. They connect to narratives of white supremacy, present inaccurate or demeaning characterizations of indigenous communities and American Indians. They are connected to historical racist acts like slavery and genocide. Uh, they only show one side of the story or a very simplified version of the story. Uh, and of course they leave people out. So uh, women, people of color and, and certain themes like labor are often left out, migration, community building. Uh, and as we know, they, they create lots of conflicts in different different views. So that's just to give you a short overview. We're going to move into the presentation part of our program. Um, I have the honor of introducing our speakers. All of them are Chicago Monuments Committee members, and I think they really speak to the diversity of our members and the substance and thoughtfulness that they represent. You'll hear from curators and historians and artists and activists. Uh, the first speaker will be Adam Green, who is an Associate Professor of American History and the College at the University of Chicago. Santiago X, whose film you just saw, a Chicago-based artist and indigenous futurist. Cesario Moreno, who is the Visual Arts Director at the National Museum of Mexican Art. And Emmanuel, Amanda Williams, who is also a Chicago-based artist, a visual artist trained as an architect. So we're going to begin with Adam Green, who's going to talk a little bit about what's at stake with monuments and about how we get to truth telling. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, thank you to all the other members of the advisory committee in this very important work. I just want to talk briefly. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit personally, and I'm also going to talk about some things beyond Chicago because I think it's important to understand the stakes of where we are in relation to how we commemorate the past and look to the future. This is actually a sculpture of the nine students who integrated Little Rock High School beginning in 1957. I bring it up because my father was one of those nine. He was Ernest Green, the first to graduate, and you can see his statue all the way in the back of this installation. This is at the Capitol 
of, of Arkansas and Little Rock. Um, and this is a shot of the dedication of those statues with all of the members of the nine um, next to their statues. This happened in 2005, actually August 31st, which was uh, a day when news about the extent of devastation in New Orleans as a result of Katrina was first coming to the public within the United States. So many different meanings coming together at an occasion of thinking about the past, as is often the case. Um, of course, I'm proud of my father. I'm proud of all of the members of the nine, but I want to draw attention to Elizabeth Eckford in the front. Many of you who know the story of the Little Rock Nine know that she was the young girl, 15 years old, who had to walk to school alone, was not able to go in the first day, and then was trailed by a mob as she left the school, threatened with harm to her body and her person, and carried that for the rest of her life and continues to carry it in terms of the memory of that period. She actually put an inscription as all of the members of the nine did on her statue, which you can see today if you were to visit it. And I wanted to bring it up here because I think it's important in terms of our conversations. If we have honestly acknowledged our painful but shared history, then we can have reconciliation. Truth telling is tremendously important in terms of putting us in a place where we can actually share not only a sense of the past, but share a sense of where we might find ourselves together in a shared future. And finding ways to be able to tell the truth in this way requires that we do things in order to move ourselves over to where we can learn lessons in relation to telling this truth. And there are three here that I put down that I, I would like to have um, advanced over here. The first, and if I could ask, no, I have it here now. The first is sharing origins to better share a future. I think the very powerful film we just saw from Santiago X reminds us that the way in which we commemorate in this nation and especially in this city where we originally came from is not yet complete. In fact, it excludes actively the place of indigenous, Indian and Native American people in how they brought together this land and how they made the conditions of Chicago possible. Acknowledgements are very important and we all must do this, but we have to go further in terms of understanding that the ways in which we have excluded people from understanding our origins have meant that we don't have a complete sense of the future that we share. We must have that full truth in order to be able to move forward to something like a shared future. Truth telling is related to truth listening. And I was very struck by the conversation with the mayor and the governor just a few moments ago about the power of listening, even when one is in a position of leadership even when one is in a position of making decisions on behalf of a whole community. I think many, many people are prepared to share truth. Many, many people are prepared to change the ways that we think about our past. But unless as many, if not more, are prepared to listen to that truth, even when, as Elizabeth Eckford told us, it is painful, we will not be able to get to where we need to go. And finally, a society that is built upon lies is one that proves to be weak. We see all sorts of ways in which the past is memorialized in Chicago and within our nation. And I think part of the reckoning that we have to come to terms with now is that if we continue to believe in half truths or if we continue to believe in outright misrepresentations of who we were and where we came from and what we've experienced, we will have a society that can't stand. And that will lead to memorials like this and memorials like this. I wanna finish with, I wanna finish with this image I want to finish with this image of the National Museum to 
uh, healing and justice. I, I can't quite get the image up here. I will end then with the slide. The image here, thank you, and apologies for the difficulty in putting that up. This image gives us a sense of how facing painful histories can be something that's inspiring, how facing painful histories can be something that's uplifting, how it can be something that moves us to think about the ways in which we can come to a shared future, in which we can face the truths that we confront through our history. And so what we're left with is what we in Chicago are prepared to do to acknowledge our own painful and shared history and the way in which that history weighs on our present today. Because without doing that, we will not be able to reconcile the people as we should. Thank you. And now we are going to hear from our panel, starting with Santiago X. Hafade, uh, Chicano, uh, Itimilaka, Amaixa, Fitu. Uh, hello, my relatives. I'm Santiago X. Um, I am a citizen of the Kosati Nation of Louisiana, uh, a member of the Turkey Clan. I'm also indigenous uh, Chamoru from the island of Guahan, uh, USA. And uh, <clears throat> I come to you from Zugagawang, Illinois, and the video that, that opened up this discussion called Acknowledgement um, that Jennifer introduced um, is, a, is a work that for me embodies um, the idea of acknowledging um, the ancestral peoples of the land in perpetuity and their relationship with the uh, people that live here today. Um, so that what you saw was a, a, the very first iteration of a series of works um, that's intended to acknowledge the ancestral peoples, acknowledge the land, the water, the air, uh, the earth, um, from different perspectives, um, from different languages. Um, so you saw the very first iteration of that, and I'm thankful for you uh, for showing it. Um, <clears throat> you know, that, that um, paired along with the image you see in front of you, um, is, is kind of like the, the entire ethos of my practice. You know, it's, it's, it's an understanding of of our role as human beings on this planet and in this cosmos to be humble, uh, to be contemplative of our role um, beyond ourselves, um, beyond our own, um, you know, facets of society and how we think collectively uh, as people existing on this planet. Um, I am a multidisciplinary artist. I'm an architect, a land artist, a new media artist. And, you know, I use the opportunities to, of, you know, installing each work to really highlight um, the potential, uh, the potentiality for us as creators, for us as human beings uh, to break through uh, the traps, the conventions um, that we build for ourselves. Like, for instance, this corner uh, of a white, white room in a gallery. Or here again, you know, there's opportunities for us to create experiences um, that push us to examine um, ourselves as people, as institutions, as you know, uh, a society, um, to really ponder, you know, what it, what it is that we are creating um, in the built environment, and how can we break free um, from the conditions that are, are are troubling or harmful. You know, as part of the Monuments and Memorials Committee. As a resident of the state of Illinois and, and the city of Chicago, um, and as an indigenous futurist, um, I think it's it, it's important for us to um, remember the foundations of of um, society, communities, civilization, um, the ancestral peoples uh, of this land. Um, here, before you, you see Cahokia, Illinois. Um, you know, at its time, uh, it was the largest. Uh, civilization in North America, um, you know, at the same time in the 1300s, it had a higher population than London, England. Um, so just to, you know, give an example of the monumentality that existed here, 
um, prior to the city um, and, and prior to colonization, um, I thought it was important to, to highlight this. Um, if you go there today, residually, you'll still see um, the mounds. You'll still see the foundations uh, for these civilizations um, and the grandeur, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's funny, this mound, uh, Monk's Mound in Cahokia actually has the exact same footprint and orientation um, as the Chicago Cultural Center downtown. Um, so it's a testament to how, to how grand and how monumental, um, you know, the earthworks um, were prior to this state and to the city. Um, you know, when we confront, um, when we confront the, the foundations of, of what this place is and, you know, um, the histories, the atrocities, uh, we can also um, establish, um, you know, through this recognition and acknowledgement, um, the truth, um, the embedded truths in this land, the embedded truths in, in the people that have uh, prospered since this uh, erasure. Um, you know, so you, these, these things aren't so celebrated uh, in the built environment in the cityscape. So for me as an artist, um, you know, my interventions, my work are about reminding, um, you know, the constituents of the city, um, empowering the indigenous people that occupy, um, you know, this land today, um, but also to, to bring it home and, and to remind everyone about the perpetuity of, of you know, acknowledging the ancestral peoples and the earth uh, below us. Um, this is a, a, a groundbreaking ceremony uh, for a, a new uh, mound that's uh, going to be built in uh, Horner Park. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, but through my work, you know, as, as a, a land artist, um, I really want to remind the city about um, what the original, you know, public art, what the original um, sacred space um, was, you know, in this city. Um, there are a number of mounds, effigy mounds, lizard mound, um, serpent mounds, you know, representing different effigies that have been erased um, for the creation of things like uh, the L line um, uh, in Lakeview, you know, and, and this is a, a universal theme uh, throughout uh, North America. And um, this is a documentation of an earthwork that was unveiled in 2019 on Indigenous Peoples Day uh, called Pocto Chinto, uh, the Serpent Twin, um, the very first uh, effigy earthwork to be created since the founding of the United States, um, as recorded. And, um, you know, the community came together to build this. Um, you know, I had, I had the vision of creating uh, an earthwork that would um, remind us in, in, uh, of our role, you know, something that would help stitch together our experience um, with the land, with the water, um, something that would, um, you know, make us feel small, a, a serpent that, that weaves in and out of the earth uh, around us, um, reminding us of, you know, our role. Here it is completed. And then, you know, when it comes to earthworks and the power of community, um, you know, there is, uh, and monuments, um, you know, as that, that's what we're talking about here today. You know, we have to contemplate um, the notion of permanence and ephemerality. Um, and, and what that means, you know, when we introduce something that we frame as permanent, um, what are we doing, you know, um, as opposed to something that um, is there for a moment and fleeting, um, you know, indigenous culture, uh, placemaking, um, you see as in uh, evident in Cahokia, um, the buildings on top of those foundations have disappeared, um, but the foundations remain. And I think that that's something we have to think about going forward. Um, here you see um, an ephemeral installation um, in Chicago um, where I harvested uh, Phragmites, uh, invasive grasses that suffocate the uh, indigenous landscape remediation of post-industrial sites. And this grass suffocates it so those indigenous plants uh, can't survive. But what I did is I harvested all that and I created uh, a hut, you know, a, a traditional silhouette of uh, ancestral placemaking um, that's meant to dissolve back into the earth. At the Chicago Architecture Biennial, I, I did the same thing. 
um, but I set it on top of a platform mound um, uh, similar to uh, the platforms in Cahokia um, and similar to platform mounds that you'd find from you know Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, trying to remind people in the, in the heart of the city um, in the event of the Chicago Architecture Biennial of the original architecture of the land, um, at the same time gesturally burning down uh, the invasive grasses um, so that we can start anew and build a mound higher. Uh, I'd like to end with um, a few projects or, or two projects that are, um, you know, going forward are, are slated to be created. Um, when we talk about building a future scape, you know, it takes, it takes a community. It takes, um, um, you know, powers and stakeholders outside of the indigenous community, um, you know, in today's climate to build these projects, you know, it, it so we are thankful for partners and, and, uh, people that share our vision uh, to create new monuments in the city that reflect um, the ancestral uh, ways of, of making places that are sacred and um, promote prosperity for indigenous people. You know, we're often thinking about, you know, when we're creating a new place or we're creating a new work of art um, as indigenous artists, where does the pain end and where does the beauty begin? Um, and I think the beauty begins when we all come together, coalesce and create these beautiful spaces um, this is a rendering of the Coiled Serpent, which is going to be um, introduced, um, hopefully, to uh, Horner Park um, in the city limits of Chicago. Uh, we're currently fundraising um, to buy the, uh, the rest of the earth and the indigenous planting to remediate this post-industrial site. Um, this is intended to be um, conjoined to the original earthwork that I showed you, Pocto Chinto. Uh, so, uh, Conceptually, those two earthworks are conjoined, so this would complete that earthwork. Um, and I'll talk about another project here. I'll finish with this. This is a, an AR experience that we are um, currently creating, um, you know, in lieu of artifacts that you would find um, in, in ancestral mounds, um, traditional um, mounds um, that, you know, are often looted by archaeologists and, and those those uh, objects are put into museums. I wanted to comment on that and, and challenge that notion by creating a, a, a digital archive um, through augmented experience of digital artifacts that um, are embedded in these places and that activate um, as you go there uh, in person and unlock you know, embedded truths about the practice, the history, the futurity of this uh, modality of, of making. Um, you'll see information like, um, you know, where the, the ceremony happened, um, you know, um, who was there, um, 3D models of how it was constructed, um, personal narrative and story of being a part of the process. Um, you'll also be able to unlock places like, um, you know, downtown and, and you know, truths of, of lands that have been unseated and, you know, these kind of things that this, this veil of, of uh, colonialism that kind of <clears throat> guises the, the, the truth of the land, the truth of the matter, um, that indigenous people still live here and, and still call this place home. And we can see through the buildings, we can see through the, the colonial monuments, and, you know, we see what's really there. And with that said, I just want to end with, um, um, you know, I think that we are, as, as artists, as, as um, activists, as, as uh, community builders, politicians, um, but more specifically, indigenous people, you know, we're more powerful in our presence than we are in our absence. So I, I like to promote, you know, everyone that's, that has the power to be a part of this process, to participate and, and not to sit on the sideline. You know, we have to have these conversations, uh, though difficult, and we have to hit it head on uh, in order to create change. So thank you very much. I'd like to um, hand it over to Cesario Moreno, um, and, and thank you, Adam and Jennifer, um, for that introduction. Buenos dias, everybody. It's good to see you, and thank you, X. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see what you're up to and uh, the important work that you do here for us in, in our city of Chicago. Um, I hope today to give everybody sort of a brief look at uh, some of the... Um, this may not be the right, uh, 
hold on one second. Yeah, this is this is not the right one. I'm sorry. Um, this is not the 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 PowerPoint that I was supposed to do. Um, is there any way that maybe we can go to Amanda and uh, try to figure this out? Thank you. Good morning. This is a great conversation. I'm so glad to be here. Um, it's actually wonderful to follow X to talk about um, the same sorts of subjects from a slightly um, different set of lenses as an artist. I think that everything that X mentioned is super important and I'm going to insert in addition to the, the uh, elements that he's brought up ideas about time and about what it means to um, not confuse ephemerality with level of significance. And so I think it's important to understand that often the communities that have been erased intentionally or have been left out of histories are the ones that are most in tune with the idea that things need to go away sometimes. So I'm gonna share with you um, one memorial project and one monumental project that I'm working on to offer in our later panel discussion and conversation as examples of how we might think through um, these two terms that have been so critical to the work we've been doing as a committee. So I think it's important to ask how we can heal when a trauma is ongoing. It's often um, convenient and I think reassuring to mainstream media as well as larger society to very quickly erase or want to um, cover over things that have happened. And we've all seen that collectively in the last month, if not several years, of excusing away unacceptable society. And so as artists tasked with uh, projects that are about healing, that are about memory, what does it really mean to try to heal when a trauma isn't going away? And how can we use words like unity when there's not been acknowledgement and accountability? These are things that Jennifer mentioned. These are things that Candace mentioned. Uh, the governor and the mayor touched upon it. But I think it's important to repeat it maybe from a slightly uh, different set of words to really emphasize the idea that the accountability and the acknowledgement are not just saying the words, but are really sitting with the pain, not just for those who were the recipients, but those who were the actors. And so how do we really reconcile that these are traditions that somehow make us comfortable, but that these are also narratives that were created in order to amplify, to rewrite, or in some cases to completely fabricate histories that didn't exist, but needed to be parts of other people's healings when the world around them wasn't the way that they wanted it to be. And so I began a project two years ago at Smith College as part of a commissioned work that asked the question of how do you bring closure to something that lingers, and how do you memorialize an injustice that's ongoing? Exactly those questions I asked. And they came about as a result of this bucolic, small, private women's institution um, being shrouded with Black Lives Matter banners on their residential housing. So this is something incredibly unsettling, knowing that they have a very small Black population. I wondered who had made these and who exactly they were talking to whose black lives actually mattered in these places and on this architecture. And so also, what does it mean to insert uncomfortable conversations into this landscape? And at the time, Black Lives Matter had, had been a term that had become so saturated um, that it felt like people didn't want to acknowledge what it was trying to um, announce. It has since come back into the public dialogue in a way that none of us could have expected. This was back in 2018. 
um, in the beginning of 2019. And so what does it mean when something very important also becomes illegible to our ears? And how do we translate that? And so I began creating a project that really looked at the edge of understanding and legibility and used these banners that the students themselves had made um, and had authored with their own hands to think about what it means for these things to linger, for them to be in conflict with how people might be feeling on the inside or the actions that might be happening on the inside of these residences with their reports of discrimination, uh, people being um, profiled or arrested for similar to Yale for sitting in common areas or for falling asleep while studying. So what does it mean to make such a declaration and then not to embody it? What does it mean for us to move through a city and see statues of people we know probably would have tried to kill us were they alive today and definitely gave harm to our ancestors? Where are the scars? What happens when healing doesn't acknowledge that you are changed forever and that that has an outward or visible mark or appearance? And so this is the final banner that was created to be in dialogue with the banners that, that live on the houses around the campus. And they'll be up for two years. They'll fade, they'll go away, but they also will be uncomfortable to people. They'll be confusing to people. And it starts a dialogue and their endurance in addition to their ephemerality, is just enough time for people to have to talk to one another as they pass these. And we'll have a series of conversations around the subject of both the meaning of these banners and what it means to have to really be accountable and to be in a process of healing, not just a before or an after. They're going up as we speak. So here you can see the banners going up along walkways in the campus. The one on the left says, lead matterful black lives. I think it's also important to acknowledge that those who um, have been perpetrated against also need healing and memorials in ways that are very different than those who have been the perpetrators. And so what does it mean to move past having to start at what I feel is sub-zero, just acknowledging that we should matter to actually being matterful. And so in this instance, I want those students for whom they already understood that Black Lives Matter to really understand what it might mean to lead matterful Black lives. And there's the banner on the front. And then the second project I want to um, add to this conversation today is about monuments in the specific way in which we probably have been imagining them um, as citizens of Chicago and as this committee. Um, I was selected along with Lake Jayafus to create the first of what is the She Built New York Initiative, which is a, a program in New York, not, diff not so different from the program that we have established in Chicago, with a committee that got together to think about how to reimagine monuments. In that case, in 2018, it was about the absence of women in the over 150 monuments that existed in the city. And so, um, as part of that process, over 2,000 names were submitted by the larger New York community, and that list was narrowed down to um, five. And then also finalists, artists, there was a general call for artists, and then artists were whittled down to a finalist list. And so we were asked to create a monument for Shirley Chisholm as the first of the five. It will exist here in Prospect Park on the Oceanside entrance, for those of you that are familiar with New York City. So not the side with the Brooklyn, um, with the Brooklyn Public Library, but the, the sort of backside. And so this is her congressional district. So what might it mean to create a monument, this first in a series, um, in a brief that really called to reimagine what monuments should physically look like and what they might embody? So Lake and I were the recipients of the commission. This was awarded to us a few years ago. And I think it's also important that we talk a little bit about the logistics of process and what it means to try to figure out something that has not been done or has not been done in this way before. And so part of the growing pains are that it's still in progress some two and a half years later, that it was integrated into a city works program um, and that the project for us as architects, as is Santiago, really needed to be about placemaking and not die cast 
uh, lone singular bronze figures. There are sometimes places for that, but there's also room to really think about what it means to not put individuals on pedestals, but to create places for the collective. And so for us, it was really important to think about how you embody someone like Shirley Chisholm, who, who looms larger than life, literally, but also was a um, staunch proponent of making sure that she made room constantly for others and understood that hers was just but one of what should be a legacy of civil servants who continue that trend. And so we took her iconic visage and we actually enwrapped it with the US Capitol. And we imagine what it might be like to create something that if seen from different vantage points, it sits at an intersection of um, three streets that come together, that it might change from something that gives a recognition of her silhouette to something that gives a recognition that it's also the gates or a threshold between the city limits and the more pastoral park and what it might mean to move between places and the way that she moved and to use some of that imagery to create the patterning of the actual structure. And then to take that congressional seating, that amphitheater in the ground so that there are seats come after her. So it's important for us that every day, at least every day that it's sunny, you'll see her face from certain vantage points and also through that shadow, but that at other points in moving around the structure or approaching it from different vantage points, that you'll see more the space and more your relationship to the space it becomes a beacon, a place to gather, a place to pause, a place for education, but also a place that can blend in, maybe you forget about. And so I think it's critical that we imagine that while permanence and, and monumentality are critical to thinking about paying tribute to these larger than life icons and figures, that we also have to be respectful of the idea that as we change, as society changes, as we grow hopefully together, different needs will occur. And we have to create I'd like to, I think, hand it back over to Cesario, and then we're going to enter into panel discussion. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. All right. Um, when I started this, it's good to be here and share a little bit about uh, the, the Latinx community in Chicago. We're focusing primarily on the uh, Mexican and Puerto Rican groups because they are the largest group population wise and have been a part of this city for a long, long time. Um, I'm going to sort of go through and uh, take a brief look uh, at which monuments and memorials uh, have commemorated and celebrated uh, our communities. The first one uh, here was one that was put up uh, in, the, in 1990. Uh, it was an architectural, traditional uh, Mexican uh, uh, little village kind of uh, uh, bridge, right? It's, a, it's an arch, I'm sorry. And um, I think that the, the citizens, the residents, the people who lived in Little Village wanted to welcome and mark their space. So uh, as we heard from X and from Amanda, architecture is always a, a big part of that, even though we don't always think of them as being memorials or monuments, um, they actually are because they memorialize a community, not necessarily an individual. Um, there we go, whoops, go back. There we go. Um, on the north side of the city, the Puerto Rican community also marked their neighborhood in a much more contemporary way. Uh, I've got to say that this flag on Division Street in Humboldt Park is probably uh, one of the, the landmarks of the city of Chicago that has appeared most in selfies. Uh, it is beautiful, it's proud, and it certainly 
uh, lets people know where you are. It is a marker and a monument to the community uh, that welcomes everybody. Um, going back, uh, it's, it's obvious that murals have always been a, a part now of our neighborhoods for some decades. Uh, oftentimes people don't realize that uh, Mario Castillo, you see him there in the middle, he was a professor at Columbia College and as, as well as many other uh, roles that he played here in the US. He is accredited with uh, having painted the very first Latino, Chicano, Mexican American uh, mural in uh, the United States. Uh, so that, that, does not, that, that does not go to California or to the Southwest. It is uh, totally a Chicago Pilsen uh, uh, award that we have. This is the mural that he painted. Uh, he painted it in 1968. Uh, a year after the the um, uh, the Wall of Respect went up on 43rd Street in the African American uh, community, um, and if if we think about everything that was happening in '68, he called it peace, metaphysica, uh, and and you know it was the year when when Martin Luther King was assassinated, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, uh, the Democratic National Convention, the student protests, the Olympics in Mexico City that had the the Black Power salute. Uh, um, and of course, it was also when uh, the Apollo um, orbited the moon, the, the, the space program. So there was a lot happening that year. And I think that his, his approach of using contemporary indigenous cosmology uh, is, was very, very fitting. A um, couple of years later, Casa Aslan opens in the Pilsen neighborhood, uh, and it's a social service place that really took the arts uh, as, a, as a way to, to teach and also for first voice empowerment, self-empowerment. Um, it, was, it was created a lot by artists uh, who had been pushed out of their neighborhood, uh, formerly in, in the uh, Taylor Street neighborhood, um, after the building of the expressway and the uh, UIC campus, uh, two huge city projects. Uh, by the daily administration that really displaced so many people, not only Mexicans, many people had to leave there. But uh, fortunately, that's when Pilsen was uh, created. Uh, the first Puerto Rican mural on the north side, again, is uh, um, social political themes. And if, if you notice the difference between the last ones and this one, here is the, the artists look back to Puerto Rico uh, and look to their heroes, right? They, they look to, um, for community empowerment in Chicago, they look back to the island. Uh, the mural tours, many people think it's kind of a new thing. They started in the 70s right away. Uh, and again, you can see here in Pilsen, uh, oftentimes it was, um, it was men from history books that wound up on the walls, uh, you know, there's, it was, it was a definitely a different time period. Uh, but what I do want to point out is that murals and honest art, honest uh, expressions from a community oftentimes do uh, bring in people from outside of the community to admire it at first. Uh, and then oftentimes though, that ends up with gentrification. Um, in this image of Jose, uh, Gonzalez, uh, we see him using indigenous iconography again. Uh, the Chicano movement uh, in the 70s really relied heavily on its indigenous uh, ancient Mesoamerican uh, roots. And they took a lot of the mythology and incorporated it into their artwork. Uh, this piece, by the way, on Hubbard Street uh, is still there today. It's, it's, uh, I'd like to think it's protected uh, by a lot of trees that grew around it. Going back to the bronze, uh, you can see behind me here, we have um, Benito Juarez. He is uh, Mexico's first and only indigenous president. Uh, he was the 26th president uh, for many years. He's a Zapotec, was a Zapotec indigenous man. Uh, and to this day, he is really still beloved uh, certainly in Chicago, we have Benito Juarez on many walls. Uh, we have a school named after him, uh, again, here in Pilsen. Uh, but as you can see on the left, when there was probably over 50,000 
uh, people of Mexican descent living in the Chicagoland area. Uh, that's when the president of Mexico uh, gave this as a gift. It went up on Michigan Avenue. Uh, and then in 1999, uh, when the population of Mexicans in Chicago uh, surpassed 700,000, uh, obviously we, we needed a larger Benito Juarez. I like to think of it as sort of a parallel uh, that happened as the community grew, so did Benito. Um, another uh, individual who is uh, memorialized in, in bronze is uh, Don Pedro Campos from the Puerto Rican uh, independence movement. Uh, he, he really sparked the, the uh, uh, imagination of Puerto Ricans living in Chicago, in New York, in the United States. Uh, Don Pedro Campos was a teacher, he was a lawyer, he was imprisoned for 26 years. And the interesting thing, I won't, I won't go into much more detail about this, but um, Commissioner Margaret Burroughs is the one who really supported this statue, this commemoration, this memorial uh, to Campos uh, in the Chicago Park District. And there was uh, some, some arguing at the time, and uh, he was not fully uh, taken out, but you know, he, is, he is there, but not on public lands. There we go. Uh, contemporary artists who mark and memorialize their history in Chicago. These are two examples from uh, four years ago. Uh, as you can see, the, the artists now, they don't only look back to the island of Puerto Rico, they look to the city of Chicago. So on the left, uh, we have uh, uh, Christian's uh, image where it, on the left of that mural, it starts out with, a, with the Taino indigenous cultures from Puerto Rico. Uh, and on the right hand, the mural sort of ends or culminates in the uh, 1966 Division Street riots uh, that, that form a huge part of the identity of, of the Puerto Ricans in Chicago. The, the photo on the right uh, is a story of the, uh, the Young Lords Party who fought gentrification uh, of the Puerto Rican community back in Lincoln Park uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. And so the artists today are not looking only back to the motherland or to the island, but really looking uh, to Chicago. Oops, I'm missing one. There, no? There we go, sorry. I don't know how we skipped that one. Um, other artists working present day Chicago um, are Sam and Sandra. They did this beautiful mural uh, that really looks at the diversity uh, within our communities, the multicultural community, the multiracial community, LGBTQ plus community, uh, and really celebrates what Chicago is today. Uh, so obviously still looking back uh, to where their ancestry came from, but also celebrating what we have today in, in the city of Chicago. Um, very quickly, I'm going to go through uh, what I consider to be a very important um, important way of memorializing uh, that comes from, from Mexico and Mesoamerica. Um, the first Day of the Dead exhibition was in the 80s. Uh, it was a time when um, um, the idea of Day of the Dead was something still kind of new and people didn't understand it uh, all too much. Um, whoops. Back one. Well, that's a nighttime shot. Anyhow, we have here in Harrison Park a celebration every year. Uh, it's on the last Sunday of October, um, and it brings together thousands of people. Um, and what it is is people memorialize. Um, they, they celebrate and they memorialize their families. Uh, they memorialize old traditions, and it's a way of of passing on stories. Another uh, sort of ephemeral way of memorializing individuals is the ghost bike that we see in many parts of the city. Uh, the ghost bikes, is, is, uh, they're installed in the urban landscape uh, and oftentimes uh, they, they look to cyclists' rights in the, in the city. Um, and I'm just gonna close with this last image uh, as ways to heal uh, through honest and heartfelt remembrance. Um, ephemeral pieces can also be extremely powerful. Um, they can be filled with ritual and celebration of our past 
for our present struggles in this country. Um, and with that, I turn it back over to, to the group. Thank you. Thank you all for these very powerful presentations and also for helping us to imagine the range of possibilities of what's possible and remembering the past, engaging the past, questioning the past, marking public space um, collectively and accountably, accountably as we move into the future. Um, so I understand we have a few minutes to process. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, and we have some questions from the audience as well. A lot of you touched on this idea that of uh, this framework that Adam set us up for, um, thinking about this progression of truth telling to healing. But I wonder if we could bring it back to that and talk more deliberately about how your work moves along that progression from truth telling to healing. And there's a related question from the audience. So I'm just going to read that. They say, I love this concept of artistic healing, exclamation point. How do you, how do communities and organizations that support community and have space and opportunity for such an initiative get involved? So think about the progression from truth telling to, to healing and also the involvement of communities in that process. Anyone want, want to take a stab? I'll, you know, I'll I, I would say that. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think. You saw both um, X's work in mind that it's always very participatory. So I think at a very surface level, obviously there's always opportunity with artists whose practices embody that, that it, that it never is about them, is it about a collective and also that you can see the hands and that there's not a control in some instances that because there are, are all hands, it has a very different feel. What I would also urge in this moment that that organizations that are invested in this work, even if they're not arts organizations, really think about um, kind of recalibrating what they think they want a memorial or a monument to mean. I think we've given you a range of moments in which that can happen in an ongoing process that's not a finite thing. I think we're so anxious to be done with trauma or be done with the exhaustion that we want heal to mean past tense. And so what does it mean to have to linger with things? So there are a variety of organizations that want it, to really embrace that. And so don't feel compelled to make something that has to last forever. Or don't feel compelled to make things that um, have to go away after today. So I think uh, Day of the Dead is a great example. I think things that, that happen um, ritualistically are great examples. But you know, really expand and don't feel like if you don't have a monument to the thing or the person that you feel is important, that it means that it's not being memorialized or that it's not monumental. That's a much longer process of educating. And I think that artists also play a role in that. Not every artist wants to do that. So make sure you want to connect with artists that are aligned with your mission or with what you're working on. I mean, I think there's an anxiousness to do, but as we heard from the mayor and the governor, sometimes the listening is, is kind of the, the healing as well. It has to be part of the process. I was going to say that, that uh, working with artists is always so important. Um, and again, listening is, as a curator, I don't think there's anything more important you can do than listen. Uh, and of course, you're going to hear different stories and different uh, opposing sides, which is part of this whole process. Uh, but if you're not listening, you, you're run the risk of uh, going too quickly and moving into, into dangerous territories. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to add that I think, you know, yeah, I think, I think my mentality um, and the importance of, of the moment is, is interrelated. I think, you know, the reason that these, um, these things we create have so much importance is because of the people that believe in the concept or the history the lineage, the ancestry, uh, the power of influence of that moment and that person or that people or that place. And I, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's up to us uh, collectively and as, as community, um, engaged in community to create these moments and to celebrate that moment, however we feel, you know, should be implemented. And um, like the creation of the earthworks um, that I presented it's that those those works are beyond me. You know, I, I I planted a seed, and it's up to the community to water it and and to watch it grow. 
And I think that um, when we propose new new places, uh, you know, new monuments, um, it's the power is, is is all of ours. You know, so if you want to be a part of the process or or you know a part of that dialogue, uh, participate in any way you can monetarily um, through um, forums, through you know. Uh, you know, letters to to the powers that be. Um, be a part of it. You know, it's up to all of us. A great invitation. We're we're getting soon to closing, and I wanted to give Adam a chance to raise a question or comment on anything that's been said. Thanks, and thank you um, to the three of you for the wonderful presentations. Maybe a different progression is from past to future because often we think that the work of recognizing the past is enough. But as I tried to suggest, if we don't envision the future that we can share, we're gonna get a future that is not one in which we can share. So how do we think about that progression? In relation Anyone to Anyone wanna have that in... close, close, closing word? <laughs> You're talking about past the future and the transition? Yes. Yeah, or, or like what, how do we get to a future that we can share by the kind of work that we do about remembering the past? Mm. I think, I think we, have to, we have to come at a, a lens of honoring each other and honoring, you know, honoring our, our, our collective experience and story as, as a humanity on this earth. You know, as simple as that, we need to celebrate the moment, each other being here together, and and you know, celebrate you know, uh, togetherness. You know, however that may be, um, through the creation of equity, so that our our voices are are all heard. Right. Yeah. You know, I, one I, thank another. you. Oh, go ahead. I don't know exactly right. how uh, how to do that, but I do know that art is one of the greatest vehicles to bring people together. Uh, it gives you a chance to stand in somebody else's shoes for a few moments, whether you are listening to their poetry, hearing their song, or seeing their artwork. It gives you a moment to really stand outside of yourself and imagine what somebody else sees. Uh, I think that's the power of art, and I think that that is one of the ways in which uh, the arts, in you know, the the, the arts in general, uh, they bring out our human nature and uh, really do. Uh, affect us in, in spectacular ways, exciting ways. Thank you. And I think honoring each other and the arts is a perfect note to end on. There's so much more to talk about, but please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists and speakers. Next up, we'll have a spoken word performance from Logan Liu and a video about Tanika Johnson's Folded Map Project. Thank you all for joining us. Hello everyone, and thank you for checking out Together We Heal Summit 2021. My name is Logan Liu, and these next two poems are about the healing of the humanhood in the Puerto Rican community. They're part of an upcoming project called Raices to Roots. I hope you enjoy. Abuela's favorite room at home is the kitchen. La sangre llama, Abuela says. Her accent is one of the last sounds left. 50 years of tough city living got her reminiscing of a warmer place. Maybe that's why she likes to spend so much of her time in la cocina. This is her time capsule. Childhood memories come back to her every time she sprinkles seasoning. Here, she offers advice con sabor. Sol sofrito con amor en la cocina is where Abuela sits next to the window of our third floor apartment. I could swear she was looking at the city's snow-covered rooftops like they were the rolling green mountains of Arjuntas. The window in our tiny cocina overlooks an alley a gallery of hood stories where she would see Tony and George playing the art of catch, Juanita and Lucy playing tag. Oye, ven a comer. The mornings were coffee, strong. 
it was her sunrise ritual to awake the senses. A can of Bustelo sits next to the stove while she has her pan con mantequilla. The afternoons brought bacalao frying. The sizzles sounded like a crispy ocean. Abuela plays music while she washes dishes. The faucet sounds like a waterfall. Salsa is dripping from the alarm clock radio. She dances with the mop. Abuela's cocina is where I learned how to speak Puerto Rican, sofrito, pilon, malanga, yuca, machuca, and I wait patiently for my food. Maybe it's that miniature flag hanging from the rearview mirror, that chacho brother, the cruising down Fullerton in June, halfway hanging out the passenger side window. The smell of garlic still on your clothes and hair, even after you left the restaurant. The blended rainbow family walking together to church. Salsa Sundays at the Cubby Bear. We know each other. Maybe it's the familiar features in your face, that face from Caguas, the eyes of La Familia Torres, the Lugo nose, the smile of the Irisaris, the tired travels of your family is shown in the posture of your body. Tell me, I know you, and you know me. We got the same barber, somewhere on Kedzi, and he's always late and talks too much, especially when you're late to work. That drop of the S in our Spanish, the L in our R, the map on our back because of the history we carry, the gold cross on our neck, the celebration of Los Tres Reyes wearing winter coats in the slush of the snow and ice because it's January in the unforgiving Midwest. The waiting for the Armitage Avenue bus on blistering balmy days. Can it be? The rivers of San Lorenzo have crossed and landed onto O'Hare Airport, took the blue line, got off, and washed our feet, leaving behind the sediments of Caribbean soil, the undertow, begging us back, but our feet with our flag planted peacefully in the concrete of the cracked sidewalks. The vast caldero of Aro left on the stove. There's nowhere else to put it. The giant wooden spoon and fork in the kitchen for no good reason. Abuela's plastic on the couch was an adhesive activated with the sweat from your summer. We are one people. We smile with each other. When we recognize the adobo in our words, we share a common bridge built with the hopes of our loved ones that the brick buildings and relentless weather is worth the trade from the green mountains and clear rivers here we met in basement juke jams on the streets of summer festivals catching each other in a dance circle to house or hip-hop Walking through alleys for shortcuts, hearing dominoes, smacking with defiance on wooden tables from backyard birthday parties. Here, home adapted to us, no words need to be said. La conexión, is this why our pride flies? Somo poco, pero somo grande. Nuestra gente, with sacred symbols from Taino petroglyphs tattooed to our veins, informs the innate way we move. We speak so we can find each other. Oceans away, tell me your name, and I'll tell you mine, and the hood I'm from, and the town I'm from. Like I'm Louis de Levitown and Logan Square, and you'll tell me about your cousins who are also from there. Black parties are the best. The fire pump popped open on sweating days, and like a waterfall in El Junque, it blesses us all. Bomba will beat in storefront spaces, fogging up the windows from the breath of the baile. The dancers directing the drums, demanding we dig into the depths of our origin together. This is how we know each other. When we hear Eli Samuel's baril transmit the spirits of Africans to Chicago, we cannot help but feel the flashbacks of our land. And after the music has stopped, and the dancers are still, and the sun has slept, our hearts remain connected to the cement 
and to the sand and to each other's pulse. Chicago residents Nanette Tucker and Wade Wilson share a love of gardening and craft beer. That would be kind of cool. It would be cool. <laughs> They're like neighbors, sort of. Wade has called your map twin. Why are you guys twins? We're twins because when you follow the map, we touch one another on the map, north and south. Like many cities, Chicago's a grid with many streets spanning north to south. If you fold a map of the city in half, you can match addresses on the north side with the same block on the south side. You lived all your life never thinking you had a twin. <laughs> and now... Now I have one. Yes. <laughs> they live about 15 miles apart, but Wilson and his wife Jennifer live in the majority white north side neighborhood of Edgewater, while Tucker is in the mostly black south side neighborhood of Englewood. How would you explain the differences between both of your neighborhoods, which are essentially equidistant from the center, but worlds apart in many ways. It's very clear that neighborhoods primarily on the north side have had more investment. Everything from the street lighting to grocery stores and restaurants, it's plentiful on the north side and it's not here. It's almost like you, you feel a light come on at a certain spot when you're going north. And when you're coming back south, you can feel the gloom that's upon us in Inglewood. Curiosity. They met through Tonika Lewis Johnson, a social justice artist who grew up in Inglewood, a community often in the news. Two mass shootings Shot on Chicago. in the head this afternoon. shooting claims the life of a 15-year-old boy in West Englewood. Lewis Johnson created the Folded Map Project, which includes this film, to change the conversation. She contrasts how the same street, like Ashland Avenue, they look very different. Looks on the north side, the sidewalks and the south side the maintenance of the building none of which have anything to do with gun violence only disinvestment Chicago's segregation is due in part to racist policies like redlining, where banks would designate properties in minority areas, delineated in red, as too risky for mortgage lending, excluding black Americans from a primary pathway of building wealth, home ownership. You have neighborhoods that are predominantly black that have low home ownership as a result of the discriminatory practices. Businesses left, so you don't have a business corridor, so therefore you don't have jobs. And now the schools are starting to fail because they aren't properly funded. Her solution, bring the North and the South together with MAP twins. It can feel so overwhelming to try to take on systemic racism, <laughs> but you have found a way to almost chip away at it one person at a time, one yeah. pair at a time. Yes, let's use segregation as the actual thing that can connect us. In her project, she doesn't shy away from uncomfortable truths. How much was your home? It was $61,000. And how much was your home? $535,000. You asked Wade and Annette what they each paid for their house. You know, it felt a little awkward. I think the awkwardness helps people understand how we're all participating in this system that was created before us. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't truly reflect how we want to connect with each other today. Frankly, we're privileged. And it's hard to sit next to a friend who hasn't enjoyed that privilege. We realize that there's an opportunity to actually do something. Wilson and Tucker are doing something together. Three years after they met through the Folded Map Project, with others, they created Englewood Renaissance. which is helping beautify parts of Englewood and is now focusing on increasing home ownership here. Creating a community together. The economics might be different. The neighborhoods might be different. But the core of who I am is pretty much the same as Wade and Jennifer. I want the same things they want. For CBS This Morning, Adriana Diaz, Chicago.
Well, thank you. And I, I don't know about others, but this day uh, just so far has been so full. And I'm sitting uh, with a number of different thoughts. Um, one is that there is no one right, there's no one way to heal. Um, I think so much of the conversations today demonstrated that this work can and is happening in so many important and powerful ways. And our ability to embrace all of that uh, can tap into our full power. Uh, the other thing I'm sitting with is uh, this work does not start, nor does it end with an initiative called Together We Heal. And in mm -hmm. fact, this work has been the story of our city, the story of our resiliency, the story of how even we've gotten to this far and this moment needs to be about how do we continue to write that story? What will that look like? And so I'm so pleased to have uh, four amazing leaders with me um, who can share just a little bit more with us about um, some of the work that they've been doing both before, uh, in line with, aside um, and 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 continuing um, to, to move in this healing work. And so I'm gonna ask uh, our folks to introduce themselves um, quickly. And um, when you introduce yourself, your name, your organization, and then use my favorite prompt question of what's your favorite Chicago memory. But for time's sake, just give me like the one sentence version or a couple sentence version. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to uh, Jamira. Thanks, Candice. Thank you. Um, so I'm Jamira Alexander, the president and um, executive director of Public Narrative. Um, my favorite Chicago memory is actually a childhood one. Um, I was like eight years old or so. My grandmother let me go to the beach with my cousin and his friends, and they were teenagers. Big boom box, <laughs> heard the dance for the first time, like totally changed my life. But um, what made that memory so profound is that I, that was a time that I could remember teenagers enjoying the city as if it were theirs. And mm -hmm. to see like, the differences between then and now is just really alarming. Mm -hmm. wanna, Sharif, you want to go next? Uh, sure. My name is Sharif Walker. I'm the president and CEO at Bethel New Life on the west side. Um, and I'm also an Austin resident. Uh, my favorite Chicago memory is a little bit different uh, because it really involves my parents who uh, came to Evanston, Illinois with a big uh, dream and great education. And my dad was an Air Force vet. And, um, you know, we learned really quickly that uh, economics can catch up with uh, all types of black and brown people, right? So we moved quickly from Evanston to the Howard uh, street community. But, you know, that story is mostly about resilience and perseverance because my parents, uh, despite the ability to uh, get good paying jobs at the time, my dad built our furniture. And I remember my mom uh, painting the walls of the house and they were orange. And I can just remember the feel of sunlight uh, coming mm -hmm. through the front window uh, in our home just about every day and knowing that it was a good place to be. Uh, being in the city of Chicago. How, how about you, B? Sure, my name is Beatriz Ponce de Leon. I am the project manager for Healing Illinois, which is an initiative out of the Illinois Department of Human Services. Um, I grew up in Canaryville, and if those of you who know Canaryville, it's a small, historically Irish neighborhood. Um, right next door to Inglewood and, and Bridgeport. But we could see the Sears Tower from our street. I lived down the street from Tilden High School. And, you know, we didn't go downtown very often, but in the summers, my parents, my dad would always say, who wants to go down to the fountain? And whoever, you know, neighborhood friends were around and us, we would just jump in the car. And it's such a memory because I, I remember just like you get on the Dan Ryan, 47th and Dan Ryan is very kind of industrial looking. And then all of a sudden you hit Lake Shore Drive and it's blue and beautiful. Um, and then we'd be at the fountain and run around, take pictures, you know, try to get wet or not get wet. And that just was like just moments of joy that were easy to do. And it always reminds me of Chicago. Thanks. And certainly not, last but not least, Megan. Thank you. I, 
My favorite Chicago memory is probably the first time I saw the South Shore drill team um, in the Bud Billiken parade. Um, my family and I had had moved here from uh, from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and it was it was a moment of joy, but also welcoming and and feeling a connection um, to that the music and the parade um, that felt like home for for us. Awesome, awesome. And so I'm just reflecting as you guys talk about your organization. <laughs> talk about, mention briefly a little bit of the, the work you're connected to. You you all sit in very different seats, uh, some in communities, some with institutions, some with government. And I know each of each one of you have been engaged around the healing work, uh, certainly in the last couple of months, but, but, that, but you know, for many, much longer than that. So I just want to get a reflection from, from folks about something either you've learned or you've observed or you're thinking about in, in, in relationship to the work that you've been involved in the last couple months. Um, and maybe, uh, Megan, I'll start with you. Um, um, I know you're doing some, some interesting and cool work when it comes to students. So could you, could you share? Yes, thank you. Um, we did a student voice healing circle um, in Network 16, which um, with the schools on the southwest side of the city that I work with, um, we already had student voice committees, but I think we took it, I took it for granted that we were having these conversations. Um, and I think what really stood out for, for me is a reminder that we need to um, have young people at the table, not just to give feedback, not just um, to kind of brainstorm, um, but to co-construct, to be shared leaders um, in the work that needs to happen. No, that, 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 that's powerful. And I, I definitely feel like I, that has been a consistent theme that I've been hearing as we talk about healing work is um, how are we involving young people? How are we listening to young people? How are we uh, listening to community? Um, and so that makes me think of a lot of the work that you're doing, Sharif, and, and, and in community, particularly on the West Side, um, related to like Austin and West Garfield Park. So can you share a little bit more yeah, sure. Um, I've been at Bethel New Life uh, just over six months. And so it's been a really interesting ride so far. You know, we have uh, senior housing on our campus and we have young people on our campus and we're surrounded by community. And so uh, having interactions almost every day with people that have been a part of the Bethel story for, you know, it's 41 years of existence brings to uh, light a different story just about in everyone I talk to that's um, stories of resilience that aren't always heard. And so when we think about racial healing and what needs to happen to get to a point where communities and families are healing, uh, I think it's one thing that really does need to happen is we do need to have um, more of a environment that allows and invites those different stories to be heard. Because how do we plan healing without healing, uh, hearing the stories of those that need it most? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like you guys are giving me the perfect transition. So, because you just said the word story. And when I hear the word story, I'm thinking about public narrative. And I'm thinking specifically about the candid conversation we just had with the storytellers, which um, I don't know about you, Jamira, I just felt like was so power. There was just such richness coming out of that conversation. But you work directly in the business and, and in, the, in, the, in the community of storytellers. Um, what, what are some of your reflections? Yeah, you know, storytellers are, are unique people, you know. Um, you can trust their language and it's, it's typically based on experience. And I think when we talk about healing, we have to look at the language. You know, we can say that we're healing and that becomes this buzz word, but what actions are we putting with it? And the storytellers are often the people to help, you know, 
draw out that imagery of what they've seen and how they've experienced it. And, and, and even the stories that they've heard, being able to relay that information. You know, this series was really profound to hear from the healers, the neighbors, the faith leaders, the storytellers, and to really like understand everyone having a different perspective. I think the thing that was most profound for me is in even in times when, you know, their, um, their beliefs or their perspectives didn't quite align, there was that example of how we disagree peaceably. And to be able to just witness that, you know, spur of the moment, many of them did not know each other prior to the conversations. To be able to see that impromptu synergy um, was really powerful. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. And I think what was interesting for me is uh, really seeing it across uh, people who do healing work, people who do, uh, who are faith leaders, people who are neighbors. I mean, Tanika it talks about this folded mapping, this folded map project that just brings people from different parts of the city together. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I certainly take a lot of this in sitting in a role in which I am a part of city government. And, and you know, I shared earlier that, that the big question of what is our role? And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about you, B, you're at the state, so you're mm -hmm. even a much bigger <laughs> jurisdiction than I'm talking about. And so it's hard to think about what, um, when it comes to this, like, you know, this really authentic need to heal, what is the role of a government? What is the role of, an, of, of, of a jurisdiction uh, like the state? And I, and I know um, you all have done some really important work uh, in, in thinking about at least an initial response to that. Yes, thanks for that question. I, you know, I think it's the first, we, we did a little bit of um, research to see if any other state agencies were um, launching healing, racial healing projects. And it looks like Illinois might be the only one right now doing it at this scale, which was the Healing Illinois Initiative. So that's amazing. Like to think that we have an administration that made a commitment of putting dollars into organizations, large and small, across the whole state. So Healing Illinois um, funded four and a half million dollars worth of projects. And we really thought um, with our partner, the Chicago Community Trust, about how to distribute that money equitably across the state, making sure that it wasn't just by population or by who applied for the grants, but made an effort to get it into every area of, of Illinois. And we did, we, you know, there's funding, um, in over 25 counties and then some of those groups are making grants and um, contracting with others so it kind of reaches about 50 counties across the state all a wide range of projects um, and i think you know I, I can talk a little bit more about the specifics but in terms of reflecting on the role of the state having that leadership which we saw even today in the conversation between the governor and the mayor but having your your leader say racial healing is important for us as individuals and as a state and as an institution that that goes a long way um, in terms of like thinking back to the reflection question, I think one thing I've learned in this project is that it, it isn't, definitely racial healing starts with conversation and with personal and interpersonal change, but it is a journey and it has to include institutional change. So we have to get to a point where if we wanna heal as a community, as a society, as a state or a city, there has to also be those um, changes to the oppressive racist systems that we have. and. Um, but we, we sometimes have focused too much on the institution and not on the individuals. And so it's been really powerful to see people participate on that individual and interpersonal level so that they're, they are on their own healing journey and are able to bring that to their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with that. And, and, and the reality is this isn't just about conversation. Conversation is key. It's fundamental. It's connections. It's understanding. It's all of that. Mm -hmm. But there is this sense of action, the sense of movement, the sense of we are a journey, we are progressing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know about you all, but I'm sitting with this big question, especially after listening to so many of the comments from earlier. Like, what, what, what might, what might be possible here? Like, what, what, mm -hmm. what is a future uh, around some of this work even begin to look like. Um, I, I don't know, uh, uh, Megan, I know we've had a couple of conversations about um, how, do, how are we thinking about student voice and uh, building that sense of future. Do you want to share? Yes. Um, I'm lucky to work with young people across 17 schools um, and that 
I think we keep saying how amazing our young people are. It certainly um, goes without saying that the space that we create for them, the opportunity we create, they will take and run with it. And um, in our in Chicago public schools, our equity framework calls out inclusive partnerships. And, and we framed young people as part of that, that vision of inclusive partnerships, which is a guiding principle um, for all the work we do. Um, but as B was saying, call, naming it, naming um, healing and naming inclusive partnerships and liberatory thinking as a priority for the work that, that we do and for me as the network chief with a group of schools to be uh, in dialogue with students and with teachers um, and having principals be part of healing sets that as a, as a priority. Um, but then it's my responsibility to, we've opened that space, now how do we build the infrastructure to continue elevating young people? Um, to bring them back to the table and be part of the planning um, that will that will last and they, they'll take into the future. Uh, anyone else, what is it, what is, what do you see for the future? What are you visioning on for the future? I really see more collaboration, you know, and authentic engagement. Um, there's a lot of investment that our communities need. And just as B said, like we invest a lot of times in the structure, but not so much the people. We have to invest in our people. Our, our people are our greatest resource. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that like, if we can't do right by people or make them better, then it's best to simply leave them alone. Like someone will come across their path um, who will likely be able to support them in ways that we can't. But even with that, there's a, a need for, um, the great work that is done behind the scenes a lot of times to be called out into the forefront. And I think that that is a role that each of us play, you know, uh, whether you are a professed storyteller or not, there's still a story within your organization or even within your leadership that you could share that would draw someone to what, it, you know, what they need. When we think about healing, we can enter this at different phases. You know, um, I may be healing, you know, from some, generational trauma, or you may be healing from um, some more present trauma, immediate trauma. But in any event, healing takes place on all sorts of levels. So Chicago has the wherewithal to heal itself. But, you know, as we find oftentimes we're a city at war with itself, you know, we have the strikes taking place and different things of that nature. And there's a lot of politics involved, but at the same time, all of that, all of these events are impacting the lives of people who are oftentimes left, you know, with the destruction and the aftermath of decisions that they had no, you know, no insight or no, um, no feedback to really provide in helping to guide that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that in these conversations that we're having that have been initiated, that, that are continuing, that we're able to see a lot of that feedback incorporated into the decisions we make moving forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sharif, um, what are you visioning on? Yeah, I think the two previous comments were very interesting because you know, um, we're talking a lot about healing, but I don't, I don't think it's easy to heal when uh, we're not simultaneously doing some things around prevention of, you know, future harm. And so, you know, how are we looking at uh, big picture things like, uh, you know, as, as much as we're uh, separated as communities, that there are some things that each community can look at uh, structurally that can help them uh, support families and and achieve goals that are going to um, elevate uh, elevate people in those communities to a certain aspect where there's more hope and there's more um, you know understanding of what's necessary to be successful. And so you know, just going back to something we were talking about at the state and city levels is how do we dig deeper in with communities and figure out just what those communities need. Uh, what type of investment is needed and what type of partnerships are needed to really get behind full development plans for communities that don't make uh, people 
have to compartmentalize and say, you know, what do we need to make uh, the schools better? But what do we need to make um, certain institutions better? But how do we have a bigger picture of what the entire community needs so that people are working together and prioritizing based on the needs of those institutions that live within them to be stronger communities overall? B, anything you want to add? I was just thinking future because, um, you know, this work is one reflection that I that I thought about as as I was you know thinking about this conversation is just how sometimes as people of color who are working on racial justice or social justice movements, we don't take the time to take care of ourselves and and to heal. Mm -hmm. And having participated in a few racial healing circles with TRHT, I found how powerful that really was to be a part of that and hear other people talk about how they appreciated that space. So that um, the racial healing activities, like what Healing Illinois is funding, that are very individual and interpersonal oriented, um, are, are such an important component. And yet, for me, I have a tension with how do we reconcile that individual healing with the institutional change that has to happen? That we have to acknowledge the damage that racism causes every day, right? And that we have to find a way to, um, as we center our work around economic justice and, and different social justice issues, race has to be, racism has to be acknowledged and accounted for. And so in terms of thinking of the future is, how do our leaders or how do we as community um, continue to, to, to focus on that so that at the core we are working towards being anti-racist and that will bring changes at the community level, at the institutional level and individually. Um, and that people have different, they'll jump into this work in different ways. So it has to be available and open in, in different ways. And we definitely have seen that across the state. You know, there are some communities where they have never taken the time to talk about racism in the way that we're asking them to, but they are now because this was a, an opportunity. And then there are others where people are already on the front lines doing the work. And so um, it's, you know, how do we help empower that and, and get that work going? So thinking future is just bringing intentionality to weaving in the kind of personal and interpersonal racial healing with the institutional accountability and change that has to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, time is not our friend, <laughs> um, and so we're actually moving to wrap up. But I, um, you know, I'm sitting and, and listening, and uh, I just, you know, this work is so big and it's so important, and it can be tough, right? It can take a take a lot, but it can also. I always think that it's really important to find moments of joy, moments of connection, moments of celebration, even as you weather through this big and important work. And so I really love this last question that I always ask people because music is very healing to me. And so y'all already know it's coming. Uh, but like, what is a song, you know, Chicago, let's say we're making a Chicago <laughs> soundtrack for healing. And so what is a song that you would put on that soundtrack? Uh, something that heals, something that's Chicago. Uh, what would be your song? And it be if I can I can start with you this time. If you're yeah, a I really we really had to think about this one, but I love the question. So I want to represent my Mexican Chicago community here, and I'm gonna say it's a song called El Pasito Duranguense, which means like the little dance step from Durango, but it was actually founded here in Chicago by a Mexican group and it launched a whole genre of music. Mexican immigrants in Chicago started this this craze. It's kind of like a polka, you know, like Mexican kind of very joyful dancing type of song. So I'd put that on the Chicago playlist. <laughs> All right, who's got next? I can I can go. Um, you know I, I I had to dig in with my authentic self a little bit here and remember my uh, uh, childhood friend uh, Mark Holtland Hereford, who really was a fan of Sade and really helped me see a different side of an artist who really put a lot into the words she sung. And so it's a little bit different, but um, Chicago for me has been a journey of a song, no ordinary love. Right. Mm -hmm. So you think about 
the love you have for a city, but the 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 trauma and the triumph that you experience mm-hmm. with it. And to me, there's you know that's that's what's so powerful about this city is that you get to live all kind of aspects and emotions that are part of living. Mm-hmm. All right. So for me, I, this is random. I was torn between Earth, Wind, and Fire, and No Doubt, but I'm gonna go with No mm-hmm. Doubt. Um, no Doubt has this song called Underneath It All. And um, in the lyrics, it says, you're, you're really lovely underneath it all. You really love me underneath it all. And when I think about mm-hmm. Chicago, there's a lot of layers for us to peel back. But underneath it all is like this beautiful embrace of a city that we now have a very fortunate opportunity, though um, quite a bit of devastation has led us to this, but we now have the opportunity to rebuild it together. And um, mm-hmm. underneath it all, we can, you know, really see the beauty that really lies in our city. And my song um, would be Rebuild the Nation by uh, Damon Locks and the Black Monument Ensemble. He's a teaching artist at one of our schools as well. Um, and the song starts out with a young woman singing. Um, and it's, it's a, a haunting message of, I can rebuild a nation that's no longer working out. And um, that makes me think of the, the hope of young people and, and the promise, um, but also the acknowledgement, we, we need to change this. We need to heal because we need to repair our nation. That really is not, it's not working out for, for everyone right now. Yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little moderator's privilege and add my two cents and say, uh, and I've said this before, so I think my healing song would be Before I Let Go, Frankie Beverly and May's version. Um, and, and part of it is because I don't know if the words uh, really say a whole lot. I don't know. You know, I haven't done that analysis on how reflective it is. But what I love about it is, you know, Beyonce has a remix now. And so there's now this generational love for that song. And Mm -hmm. um, I imagine in Chicago summer, we're at like summer dance or something. And that song comes on. We all know what's going to happen. Like the the whole crowd will erupt. And to me, that is is joy and healing. And and it's so Chicago that I love Mm -hmm. it so much. So that would be my song. Um, uh, because I think the soundtrack has got to have some dancing, and we gotta we gotta move together with it. Uh, you, but have to I wanna, dance. you have to do the dance for us, Candice. You have to do the I'm new dance sure. for us. I appreciate you for <laughs> trying to push that. <laughs> uh, maybe one day, maybe one day. But thank you all so much. I, I I love this conversation. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your work. Um, I am just uh, sitting here in this moment knowing that we're closing out shortly, but so full, so full of what's been shared. And this is just really a taste of the work that is happening across our city. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank everyone out there who has joined us for this. Um, We're going to close out here with um, some words from Mayor Lifa. And of course, we got to have some song. So um, I just want to thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for participating in supporting the Together We Heal initiative. This effort has been made possible by more partners than I can name, but I would be remiss if I didn't give a special note of thanks to our anchor partners. This includes Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Chicago, the Chicago Community Trust, the American Jewish Committee, YWCA Chicago, the Racial Equity Rapid Response Team, the Equity Advisory Committee, and Public Narrative. This past year has been challenging for our city on many fronts. At the start of this initiative, I made a commitment to you that both myself and my team would engage in difficult conversations about the harms that have been created and how we build a path forward. I have. Leaders across the city government have, and we will continue to engage in difficult conversations because this is not the end, but just the beginning. This moment will forever change us, but it's up to us to make sure that change is for the better. As we set a vision for the year ahead, I invite you to help us build a year of healing. 
a year where we don't allow ourselves to forget all that has happened, but instead be transformed by it. A year where we advance plans and ideas that teach us about our history, working with our past and our present, and plan for a future where we can all thrive. This is a healing we need to make us stronger. We must lean into our shared faith and love for our city and our unyielding commitment to each other. So thank you and please continue to be safe. Save your sorries for the last goodbye Let's give our roses while we're here In those moments where you're most afraid So paralyzed by your fears But what if The sun didn't split the night sky And what if The moon Save your sorries for the last goodbye Let's give our love while we're here All the gifts that we hold so tightly So paralyzed by our fears But what if the flowers had no courage to bloom Second guest is too. Save your sorries for the last goodbye.